All right. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me speak here. And, and I'm sorry I couldn't come in person. It would definitely would have been uh, fun to go. I, I visited uh, SIGS before and enjoyed it, but I couldn't make it this time. Um, so I'm talking uh, about a new lab that we started at Stanford about a year ago, uh, which is uh, Dawn Infrastructure for Usable Machine Learning. And uh, this is a lab started by four professors. So Peter Bayless, Kunle Olukatun, Chris Ray, and myself. And uh, together we kind of span machine learning and systems. And this is our take on what's needed to make machine learning really usable for everyone else. Um, so if you look today, everyone agrees it's, it's the golden age of data. There are all these advances in image recognition, natural language processing, planning, information retrieval, and so on. And they're really starting to have a society scale impact. Uh, if you look at things like autonomous vehicles or personalized medicine or real-time translation, making it into real products. So it's definitely kind of happening. And there's no end in sight to advances in machine learning. So that sounds really great. Uh, but there's a little uh, caveat or asterisk associated with the story. Um, it's the golden age of data, but only for the best funded and best trained engineering teams. So if you look at any really major uh, product uh, built using machine learning, uh, these, these products are very difficult to build. The major successes uh, requires hundreds to thousands of engineers working together. If you look at a product like Siri or Alexa or the you know real-time translation or things like that. And then if you look at what those um, hundreds to thousands of people are doing, uh, most of the actual effort um, goes into things like data preparation, model tuning, experimentation and productionizing the model. So serving it, doing quality assurance, uh, you know, testing, making sure it doesn't break. So they're not all sitting around, you know, around a whiteboard and doing math and uh, coming up with machine learning models. Actually, the bulk of the work is all this other stuff around it to feed the machine learning. And this is the stuff that's really expensive. This is the stuff that limits the number of ML applications we can build, and interestingly, it hasn't really been the main focus of most researchers, either in machine learning or in systems. So it's it's very interesting, um, like here's a field where anyone you talk with in industry will tell you, yeah, the really difficult thing for us is getting data and productionizing this stuff, and then most of the research is, you know, assuming you have data, like a benchmark like ImageNet, how, you do, how do you do things better? So there's this huge gap between them. Um, we're not really the first people to talk about this. In fact, even if you look at people who do a lot of production machine learning, this is exactly what they say. So this is a paper from Google, for example, called Hidden Technical Debt in Machine Learning Systems. And they talk about how at Google, only a fraction of real world machine learning systems are composed of the machine learning code. The machine learning code is this little black box in the middle here, and you can see everything around it is much bigger, much uh, uh, more expensive to build. Data collection, feature extraction, data verification, uh, serving, and so on, monitoring. And any of these things, if it breaks, your ML application stops working. So what the question we're asking in Don um, is, um, what if anyone with, with domain expertise could build their own production quality machine learning product? So someone who's just an expert in you know, a specific area, how, how can we enable them to build these without needing a PhD in machine learning and without being an expert in systems and in hardware to actually build all that infrastructure around it? Um, so this seems, you know, this would be great to do, but it seems like maybe uh, too big of a goal because it, I just said it takes hundreds to thousands of people working together to do this. But the interesting thing is that similar um, uh, changes have actually happened before in computing. And we're trying to model what we do a little bit based on those. So one example of a technology that really became democratized that anyone can use now is search. If you think about it, search has a huge um, academic community. It's still a very active community on information retrieval, data structures like indexes for your search engine ranking and so on. 
And, you know, this stuff has been studied starting in the 1960s, how to do search on a computer. But today, any developer can add search to an application without being an expert in, in all this literature. You can just link in a library like Solar or Lucene and get pretty good search out of the box. And if it doesn't work, there are also pretty easy ways to debug and tune it and make it work acceptably. You know, it's not going to be like a world-class search engine, but it's certainly good enough for many use cases. And moreover, every computer user knows how to use search as well. So it's an interface that users are familiar with. And the key thing that we were able to do in search, but that we haven't done yet in machine learning, is actually package it up behind this interface uh, that is self-contained and that non-experts can use. Another example uh, that seems almost, um, you know, kind of too uh, simple, maybe in hindsight, but it's exciting at least, you know, if you're a database person, is SQL. So when the earliest uh, kind of um, uh, enterprise or sort of in company use cases of computing came up, building a computer application was very expensive because people had to decide, you know, you, you hired these teams of, of maybe hundreds of uh, programmers who would figure out how to lay out the data on disk, how to, how to link together records, how to query them and so on. Maybe there were things like network databases to make it easy. So only the largest companies could afford to actually build a computer application. Like maybe a bank would hire a team and decide to computerize, you know, the way it tracks account or an airline would hire and, and, and build a reservation and um, uh, a kind of a scheduling system. Um, but today we figured out that most of what folks were doing uh, in these business applications can be abstracted behind this really nice interface, which is a SQL database. And inside this interface, we can handle all these end-to-end -end concerns that were challenging before. So transactions, or durability, um, and so on. And uh, now all these applications that maybe took years to build before, a team can build this type of application in, in a few months uh, just using a SQL database. And not just the largest companies, but every company has thousands of databases. And we just kind of take it for granted that uh, data management and, and querying and layout are something that um, any uh, computer uh, programmer can use. So the key idea in both this and the search example um, is to design end-to-end -end systems that tackle the barriers to access and, and production use. So when you use a SQL database, you don't have to do the productionizing, you don't have to do the backup, any kind of verification and so on. It's all included for you to tackle this end-to-end -end use case. And we'd like to do the same uh, for machine learning. So in the dawn, project, uh, obviously there's four of us investigators were, were, and, and, and probably around 30 or 40 students. Um, so it's a, it's a fairly large group and we're building a variety of uh, projects that uh, together form a stack that spans uh, everywhere up from hardware to new user interfaces for machine learning. And it also spans all the phases of the machine learning life cycle. So data acquisition, feature engineering, uh, model training and, and productionizing. And of these model training is sort of the best studied one, but the other ones are the ones that take 80 or 90% of the work. So in the rest of the talk, I'm just gonna give you a few examples of some of these projects and uh, I'll do some, some shorter ones first and then at the end, um, I'll talk a little bit more about one project that I'm, um, uh, that I'm involved in. So I'll start uh, by talking about Macrobase, which is actually the first kind of end-to-end -end system we built that uh, meets the, the vision I set out before, like the search and SQL database type of vision, but for a machine learning problem. So in a nutshell, Macrobase is this uh, system for uh, continuous analytics that's an end-to-end -end system to, to identify, to detect, and, and identify anomalies. So this is a very common thing that a lot of people want to do with their data. A lot of people don't even do it automatically because it's too uh, complicated to set up. So the input and output of the system are pretty simple. The input is multidimensional uh, data streams, uh, so just records with a bunch of fields. And the output is it tells you anomalies, uh, but it also tells you explanations. So what, what I mean by that is which groups of data, which attributes, uh, are correlated with anomalies. So an example of an explanation might be, you know, you're delivering uh, video over the internet, but every client who's on an iPhone 
is getting very low bit rate. So there's something wrong with the iPhone sort of attribute. And that's really useful for, um, you know, for anyone actually operating um, any kind of system. Uh, by the way, this project, I should say, is, uh, is led by Peter Bayless. So it's his project, I'm just talking uh, about what it does. Um, so here's an example of what the data that goes into Macrobase would look like. This is actually uh, some example readings from a mobile application on a phone. And you can see, you know, there are all kinds of different users and, and uh, phone models and, and um, software versions and stuff involved. Um, and it's a lot of data to inspect manually even. Uh, and it's even harder to inspect uh, in a production setting where the data is streaming. You basically have to hook together a bunch of, you know, the choices of algorithms from the literature uh, to do this. So that's, that's what the data looks like. Now, what Macrobase gives you, the, the interface to Macrobase is, um, is uh, you know, this is a, a UI, but there's also a programmatic interface, is this interface where you choose a metric of interest. So, for example, you might say, I really want to look at power drain and find cases of high power drain. And then you choose other metrics that might that you want to discover if they're correlated with it. And it will find both single uh, values and also groups of attributes that are correlated. And then once you run this, uh, you'll get outputs like this that are actually sorted by how anomalous they are. So in, so this is one example output. It tells you that application version 50 on this phone called hardware, you know, M or whatever this one is, um, has a very different battery drain from the rest of the population. You can see uh, it's this really different distribution, and it, and there's this risk ratio that you know tells you how anomalous, and the support is what uh, um, basically how, how many records uh, match that. So that's the output. That's super easy for any operator to understand um, and, um, and 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 just use. And under the hood, Macrobase is using. Uh, kind of um, a bunch of algorithms, including some new uh, forms of data sketches to achieve this. So it's, it's, it's doing a combination of, uh, of basically uh, outlier detection and also frequent item set mining. And they have a, a way to do this incrementally as well, using this new type of sketch to be able to find this even in high dimensional data. So in summary, and, and, and the system can be run in both streaming and batch settings. So in summary, this is a, a, a a pretty simple but powerful uh, uh, interface for an end-to-end -end system to identify anomalies. To use this, you don't need to know machine learning. Uh, it uses a pretty general model that works well, um, you know, much of the time and, and certainly gives you the most anomalous groups when they exist. There's no separate step or system to deploy it in production. The same system works in a streaming fashion and can be used in production. And it's been designed uh, all the way from the algorithms to how they use the hardware to, to actually be efficient. Now, the really cool thing about this system is actually its users. So Peter's group uh, made this available. It's open source, and, and he had a bunch of people use it through these workshops. And uh, nearly everyone who plugs in a data source and runs it finds some anomalous group that they didn't know about and says, wow, that's kind of worth investigating. So, for example, an automotive company has used this to look at um, at basically battery drain in their cars, and they found that certain firmware um, uh, update actually caused the problem there. A uh, number of cloud companies use this for uh, uh, to monitor video delivery and also other operations inside their services. And same with mobile um, applications and manufacturing. Um, and the system is open source, and you can actually check it out online. There's a lot of active work as well. So this is one example of this kind of end-to-end -end system that can really make these techniques available to everyone. Um, the next stuff I'm going to talk about is more smaller components, but ones that come together and and could could um, benefit any system of, um, uh, including maybe macrobase. Uh, uh, and I'm going to um, start with uh, one of the systems on the interface side, which is Snorkel. So this is actually a project led by Chris Ray. So when you talk to people trying to use machine learning in practice, training data is often the key enabler and also the key barrier to entry if you don't have it. The joke in our group is that if data is the new oil, then training data, which is high quality data that has been labeled with trustworthy labels, um, is the new new oil because 
just having data by itself, you know, isn't that useful. Um, and the question uh, in this project is how can we leverage data that's expensive for humans to label at scale? So uh, let me just give an example. So if you want to build an image classifier and you just want to identify dogs and cats, for example, that's actually uh, very easy because there's data all over the internet. You can just search around and find lots of images of them. And uh, you know, if you want even more labels, you can pay people just a few cents per hour, or maybe they'll even do it for free to click, you know, to sit there and click on the dogs and cats and label them for you. So that's very easy. But if you want to train a model uh, to look, uh, you know, to say, look at X-rays and figure out, uh, you know, problems with, uh, you know, with people's bones or internal organs. Uh, you can't find lots of images of that on the internet. And if you want to hire someone to do it, you need to hire a radiologist. So that's super expensive. And you know, even if you were to pay people to do it, how many radiologists actually want to sit there clicking images all day to, to train a machine learning model? So you know, in a lot of kind of um, uh, business or scientific use cases, getting the training data uh, is, uh, is, is really the main obstacle and, and certainly the main cost in terms of dollars to actually build a machine learning application. So Snorkel um, is, a, is a system that uh, takes a different approach, which is called weak supervision. And the idea here is to expand the interface to humans and simultaneously allow them to do a lot less work. So in Snorkel, uh, instead of humans just giving labels to specific you know, images or text or whatever they're working with, um, they write little programs called labeling functions, which are short programs that you could run on an example that may give you a guess as to its label. They might not always give the right label, but uh, you know, they just need to be right um, uh, kind of more often than chance uh, for the system to work. So a simple example is, say you're looking at text documents and you want to figure out, you know, is this a complaint about like the battery uh, or about the speakers on, on, on a phone or something. Um, you might say, okay, let's look for a regular expression. If the text contains, uh, you know, crackle or uh, noise or something like that, it's probably about the speakers. Uh, that could be wrong sometimes, you know, it could, the complaint could actually be like, um, you know, I'm, uh, my, my phone is running out of battery and then making a weird noise, but um, more, more of the time, um, it's probably correct. Um, and now, so, so now the nice thing about these functions is you take them from human experts who, who know the domain, but then they're very cheap to apply to data. You can take sort of millions of unlabeled examples and just run all these functions on them to get these low quality labels. And then Snorkel uh, simultaneously learns the noise in the labeling functions, including correlations between them. So uh, it learns how much to trust each one, and and you know when it's uh, w when a lot of them agree. Uh, you know, does that mean that it's actually more likely to be correct or not? Um, and it also simultaneously uh, kind of um, um, incorporates this noise in training a target model of your choice, like say an LSTM on the text. So uh, the nice thing about this is that. Um, actually, with just a few hours of coding um, labeling functions, you can often match months of hand, la of hand labeling, um, and, uh, and maybe even more if you have a lot of unlabeled data. So as a simple example, Chris's group has been working with uh, biologists and chemists and other scientists who are building systems to automatically search the scientific literature to find things like interactions between drugs or chemicals that you know, maybe appeared in lots of case studies but aren't known. And there are a bunch of benchmarks for these. There are some poor, you know, grad students in these fields who spent like months or years reading lots of articles and, and circling, finding the keywords and actually creating a training set. Um, but then when, when the group got the, you know, those students to sit down and just ask them, hey, what do you look for in sentences? What patterns do you look for that indicate this is, you know, a potential drug interaction or something, they're able to get essentially the same result using the much larger pool of unlabeled data that's out there. So these are just a few um, uh, example uh, uh, data sets, the, these three data sets here, um, where Snorkel uh, either matches or surpasses uh, different, uh, you know, different approaches that, that people had built using this large labeled data set. 
So this project is also open source, and you know th this is one instantiation of it. But this idea of weak supervision, we think, is very powerful and could apply in lots of other interfaces, including maybe things like macro base. If you've got, say, something like log data or image data coming in, that's um, you know that's difficult to um, to, uh, uh, to label by humans. Okay, um, and then um, the. The, I also want to talk about a project on the inference side. This is actually a project that I'm involved in, uh, as long with Peter Bayless. It's our joint project, um, which is a, a way to speed up uh, inference, which is, um, again, on, on the flip side for productionizing, inference can often be the most expensive thing. And this is a project called No Scope for Video Queries. So the you know, the story for this project is pretty simple. Uh, CNNs, convolutional neural networks, uh, have given us very accurate uh, object detectors and, and image classification, uh, more, more accurate than ever. And it's a very fast moving field where these things are, keep getting better uh, every year. Um, and so, so they're awesome. So we can actually start querying visual data in the world around us. But the problem is, uh, you know, using especially the highest quality CNNs, these really deep models, uh, takes a lot of computing resources. So, for example, processing one video in real time using YOLO, which is actually, YOLO is a uh, inference optimized um, object detector, it stands for you only look once, costs essentially a whole GPU. It can happen around 30 frames per second. And so if you imagine looking at all the cameras, you know, even in a medium-sized building uh, or like a city block or something like that, um, you would need a huge data center just to do that. So in no scope, we're able uh, to make this type of inference uh, a few orders of magnitude faster with very low loss in accuracy. So how do we do this? Uh, there's actually a few uh, uh, techniques. Uh, the first the, and, and probably most important technique is model specialization. So we're given this really expensive target model that reaches excellent accuracy. Um, now using this model and the video stream from, uh, you know, from, um, from our input, as well as the specific query we want, like, you know, these models can recognize thousands of different objects classes, but the user might have a query that's just, you know, count the number of bicycles or count the number of dogs walking by or something like that. Um, we use this to train a much smaller CNN just for the output of that query. And the small model, um, it uh, not only does it output a label, but it also outputs a confidence value. So we can also decide uh, if the small model is very confident, we just go with its output. But if it's not confident, we still call the big model. So we can still get a lot of the accuracy of the big model, but speed it up by a significant factor. So that's one technique. Second technique, uh, which is similar, is training difference detectors. So obviously in video, adjacent frames are very similar. And uh, you might, uh, for example, just skip a few frames once in a while to speed up inference. But even better, if you're looking for a specific object class, you might actually design a difference detector that checks, you know, is the difference large enough or maybe after applying a few uh, convolutional filters, uh, it, you know, d d does it look like the, the thing of our class might be appearing in the video? So we train these as well, uh, again, based on your specific query uh, for, on the video. And then the final thing we do is we um, we came up with a basically a cost-based optimization algorithm to tune the thresholds for the difference detector and the specialized model. So uh, we can decide for each stream and each query, uh, you know, not only what type of difference detector to use, but how to set the threshold for for it so that we maximize throughput subject to meeting a certain target accuracy. And together, these things uh, can 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 let the system get these these large speed ups. So, just as examples of um, what this achieves, here here are kind of we, we ran this on a, a bunch of sort of real world videos, and here's kind of the best and worst results from the paper in terms of speed up. Um, so, what we see is um, you can get you can certainly get uh, 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 close to a hundred times speed up. Um, by uh, and still retain around 98% of the accuracy 
of, of this fully specialized model, which for a lot of applications is, is great if you're just trying to do statistics or counting of, of specific things happening. And uh, of course, there's a trade-off between accuracy and performance, um, but if you're willing to lose a little bit more accuracy, you can even get to sort of thousands of times uh, faster, depending on the video and on the query that you're looking at. So this is sort of an exciting area we started. We're actually working on expanding this into sort of a full-fledged uh, video query engine that supports more complicated types of queries as well. Um, and uh, this is an example of what you can do on the inference side. And again, model specialization is the sort of general technique that you could imagine applying in other places too. Um, and then the final uh, project I'll talk about is on the system side. This is a project uh, that I'm leading called Weld, which is an end-to-end -end compiler to automatically generate fast uh, training and serving code from high-level programming models for machine learning. So this is something we would use inside all the other projects so that as you hook together a bunch of operators or a bunch of labeling functions in Snorkel, uh, you still get very good performance. So what's the idea um, behind Weld. So Weld is basically focusing on um, defining an interface between analytics libraries or operators that you use in your application that can achieve high performance. Um, so today, you know, the, the standard way we compose software is, uh, is using function calls. So uh, you can use, for example, if, if you wanna just be productive doing a lot of machine learning, you can open up Python and import all these libraries that do different types of data transformation and machine learning and call a bunch of functions to, to work with data. Um, but unfortunately, it turns out that this way of composing software, which is basically the way that we abstract stuff and we become um, efficient at programming, um, is increasingly bad for performance, especially for data intensive code. So in a lot of uh, data intensive apps, we find that data movement cost dominates. And this is because the way all the functions and all the libraries are written is you have to have your data sitting somewhere in memory and pass a pointer to it in order to run over it. So we measured um, popular libraries like NumPy, Spark, uh, TensorFlow, and others. And even though each individual function in these things is highly optimized, a real application can use many dozens of, or hundreds of functions and this becomes slow. So this is actually one of the main reasons why in companies you often have data scientists writing um, you know, some kind of workflow in an exploratory setting and then they have to hand it off to an engineering team who re-implements it from scratch for higher performance and, and actually tries to fuse together everything and make it fast, um, both for training and for inference. So this is obviously a huge obstacle. One of the main reasons that those hundreds of software engineers I talked about are, are needed to, to build these applications. So in Weld, um, our approach is to basically change the interface between libraries so that we can get automatic composition that delivers high performance. Um, and basically what we're gonna do is design a common runtime. Think of it you know, kind of like a Java runtime or in some sense uh, like that. Uh, or something like CUDA, but really designed for composition of these data intensive um, applications. And we designed the runtime to support different types of algorithms all running on top of it. And underneath this will optimize across the things and also run them across diverse hardware. So this runtime has um, four components. Um, so there's the runtime API, which is what um, libraries used to submit the code they run. You can think of it as playing a similar role to say CUDA or OpenCL today. Um, then what the, what the libraries actually submit is some code in this intermediate representation, the Weld IR, which is basically a small functional language uh, that's designed to be easy to, to, to optimize across uh, functions. So I'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, then we have an optimizer for the system and we have a bunch of hardware backends and we map this to it and, and actually run it on there. So looking at the API, uh, the idea in the API is really simple and it's, it's inspired by things like Spark and TensorFlow, which also do a lot of optimization, but um, it's, it's aimed to generalize this to support a much wider variety of workloads. So the idea is uh, basically just to use lazy evaluation. So as you combine functions in your library, like say these are a bunch of like NumPy and Pandas function or something like that in Python, um, instead of computing the results right away, we return a handle for lazy evaluation. 
And then when you force the result, we look at the fragments of code that they all submitted, we combine them together and we optimize them, and we run this program against your in-memory um, application. So for APIs that are already lazy, uh, this is really easy to integrate, and for other ones you can create uh, pretty simple wrappers and things like NumPy and Pandas to make this happen. And, uh, actually, so, so that's how we made it, um, how we made it run. Um, and then the second part that's that's interesting is the intermediate representation. So obviously this needs to be simultaneously really general, so we can express lots of workloads and really easy to optimize, at least for the optimizations that matter. So we came up with this small um, functional language based on mo monad comprehensions, um, which has just these two constructs. So it's got parallel loops um, for iterating over a data set, um, and it's got um, something called builders, which are these objects, these declarative objects for producing results. Um, and these are, uh, you know, this is sort of the monad part where, where that comes in. So this is, so an example of a builder is, um, I wanna just uh, m merge items together to form a list. Or I wanna add, you know, double precision floating point numbers together to compute a sum. That's a, an example of a builder. You can insert values into it from a loop, and then at the end you can see it result. And one cool thing about builders is that they encapsulate all the synchronization that's needed, um, which is often the part that's hardware dependent in your in your code, and they can be implemented differently on different hardware. So computing a sum on a GPU, for example, might require some kind of aggregation tree. Uh, computing a sum on a CPU might be better to do using atomics, or you know, especially if there are multiple keys or something at the same time. Um, and so this is easy to abstract in here. So just as a simple example of how this works, just to give you a sense, um, I'll show um, uh, how we can implement some functional operators using builders, namely uh, map and reduce. Yeah. So let's say we want to implement map. We've got a data and a function to run on each one. We can create this thing called a vec builder, which produces a list. And then for each item in the data, we can merge f of x into this list, and we can return its result. So this, this function here basically converts a builder to, to something like an array that we can work with. And all the builders are associative um, and so, and so, this loop can actually be parallelized, and you'll still get stuff in the in the correct order for this operation. Um, now, if we wanted to implement a different operation, which is reduce, uh, the code looks really similar. Uh, the difference is we have a different builder. So, in this case, we have a kind of an identity element and a function, and we create this merger object, which is an associative uh, and commutative uh, uh, object for merging results. And again, we merge each thing into it and we get its result. Now, what's, you know, what's nice about this specific choice of the IR is it's easy to express not just these operations, but also different forms of fusion. So for example, if we have a program that does a map over the data and also a reduce over the same input data, so they're just two different things it needs to compute on the same array, the, nat the, the quickest way to write it is to have a single loop through all the data that produces both of the results. Um, and that's easy to express in, in world. You can have a for loop that updates two different builders. So basically any set of builders together is essentially still a builder and, and you can merge different values into them. Um, and so that, that makes it easy to express loop fusion and also other optimizations like loop tiling and um, uh, different things that matter for, for these kind of applications. So how does this perform? Um, so first of all, um, just, you know, the, what, the first question is, can it even achieve state-of-the-art performance for different workloads? I mean, is this really small IR with just these two constructs in there? Um, can you design a, a compiler and optimizer that does well? And um, it, it turns out that actually it can do pretty well. So we can compare it against some hand-optimized systems or systems that do uh, code generation. Um, and so we have in here the blue bars are those systems, yellow is hand-optimized code, and black is weld. Um, and uh, it, 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 it generally matches these systems. So this is comparing to the hyper database for SQL. We took the physical plans from it, and we just uh, implemented them using weld and ran those. Um, this is uh, comparing to a, a graph mat, which is a page rank. Um, it's, it's a graph processing framework that's really optimized for multi-core from Intel. Um, and this is comparing to word to vec which is a, a 
you know, a, a deep learning based model. And um, in TensorFlow, because Word to Vec uses so many distinct operators and it's pretty uh, data intensive as opposed to compute intensive, the TensorFlow developers actually recommend using a custom operator for for its gradient written in C++. So we compared with that and, you know, that thing's, it's about 1.5 times faster than us, but this is not too bad for um, automatic, like in this case, we're just automatically fusing the operators in the original TensorFlow API. So that's in terms of absolute performance. And this, this yellow bar also mat is pretty close to TensorFlow XLA actually. Um, then in terms of um, does it speed up real workloads, uh, the, the effects do appear in these real workloads as well. Um, so we look at Spark SQL, uh, NumPy, and TensorFlow. We basically integrated Weld into a subset of the operators there. And even in applications that only use one of these frameworks, um, we can get five to 10 times speed up um, and, and, and often match kind of hand optimized code. Um, and we integrated this uh, fairly uh, easily using uh, a bunch of glue code and then about 30 lines of code for each operator we ported. Um, and then the thing that Weld can do that you definitely can't do in the, in the current frameworks is cross library optimization. So this is an example of a workflow using pandas and numpy uh, Pandas and NumPy both have operators that are written in C or in Cython, uh, which are, you know, basically each operator in them has been optimized for speed. Uh, but real applications combine, you know, tens or maybe hundreds of operators. So what we're showing here is Weld, uh, if you don't use cross library optimization, it gets about a factor of nine speed up by fusing and optimizing across operators from each library individually when it can when they're next to each other. And then if you enable that, you get another factor of three. And then in Weld, the language is, um, is, is you know, completely parallel and, 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 and side effect free. So it's easy, uh, any program you put in it, you can actually run on, on, uh, on a multi-core as well. Whereas Pandas and NumPy, uh, even though they're doing data parallel operations, by default, they're not written to, to actually run on many threads. So we also can get the speed up from doing that. Um, so there's a sh short paper on Weld, and it's it's also open source if you want to check it out. And uh, we're definitely you know excited to work with groups that um, that want to use this, especially if you're building a high performance system for research. I think this is a good thing you can use inside it to to build essentially a compiler very um, quickly. So that's kind of a quick tour of the types of things we're doing. Um, uh, you know, the end goal, as I said, is to um, is to make it much easier to build these production quality ML applications for non-experts. And there are many angles to that, uh, including starting with end-to-end -end systems, which is certainly the easiest way when it's possible, and also starting with ways to empower, uh, you know, the, the people doing doing labeling, the people doing uh, uh, exploration and so on, so that you don't need this huge organization of hundreds of people just to build one machine learning application. And the exciting thing about this from a uh, research point of view is that a lot of these challenges I talked about, they're huge challenges in practice. Anyone you talk with in industry tells you, yeah, this is super expensive, whatever, but they're not that heavily studied in ML research or in systems research. Uh, because this research tends to focus on benchmarks where someone already did the hard work of labeling the data and you're just sitting there trying to come up, you know, with a, with a better model or a faster system. Um, so we really need to tackle these challenges to have uh, ML for everyone. And I encourage you, if you're interested in this stuff, to follow our uh, blog on our website to see uh, more information about all the other things we're doing. Thanks.